Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Lee Jorgensen. We're at Corkscrew Wine Bar in Portland, and it's August 23rd, 2017. And my first question for you, Lee, is why wine? Why wine? Um, you know, I grew up with an Italian mom, and um, it, wine was always part of the meal. It was always part of not just celebration, but your day-to-day -day dinners, Sunday dinners in particular. And um, I also have family my, from my mother's side, my Italian heritage. Um, my great-grandfather's family had been making wine in Italy since the 1700s. So I just grew up with the culture and grew up knowing that about my family and had always had intrigue about wine, but really didn't even know that the wine industry was a a job or a, an industry that you would get into. It's, it wasn't anything available in my, under, my undergraduate experience. I never thought about wine as a career. It, it kind of happened later on in life, so um, not that later on, but enough that I, I got to go through a few jobs that were not right for me to figure out this is what I wanted to do. So talk about like uh, kind of growing up undergraduate, um, how you got first introduced to the idea of the wine industry as a job and, mm -hmm. and sort of where you were and kind of your progression through. Sure, I was working at a corporate think tank in Washington DC. Um, and it's funny, it was one of those places that was coveted, um, it was a competitive, it was a competitive place to, to work. So you had, um, you know, people with MBAs from Wharton and Harvard, I mean, top of the elite, really, working at this particular company and doing research for Fortune 500 uh, executives. And so I was interested in the culture, per se, but the content, I, w I had zero interest. And I felt guilty about it, in a way. So I was working at this job where I was literally in a cubicle and one day, I just kind of like hit my head on the desk. And I was like, there's got to be more than this. Like, it just wasn't for me. Being in a cubicle, being in a corporate think tank, I just, even though it was a cool place to work, it was a very young, vibrant place to work. It was like that dot-com era. It just, for me, didn't feel like, I felt like a fish out of water the whole time. So um, I left the job to manage a little wine shop in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. And my parents were like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why do we pay for you to get an education? Like they didn't, because they also didn't think of it as a career path. They, they thought I was just going through some kind of pre-midlife pre crisis or something or just being, you know, a Gen X person who wasn't, <laughs> you know, wasn't being responsible or whatever. But short, shortly after working at this little wine shop in DuPont Circle, my parents really quickly, you know, kind of realized this is not only a great career, but this is what she should be doing. So I got support right away from my parents. So where from there? How did you progress from there? So I was at this little wine shop, and um, the next thing I, I knew, I, you know, I, I learned a good sense of the world of wine in this particular job, and then um, I decided I wanted to learn more. So I enrolled in the Wine and Spirit Education Trust um, certificate program. Back then it was like, you had, it was different than it is now. There were like two, you had an intermediate certificate and an advanced certificate. So I was in the intermediate, and um, and then while I did that, I left and worked at a Virginia winery in Middleburg called Chrysalis Vineyards. And Chrysalis was um, this really special place that was ahead of its time in many ways. The proprietress, Jenny McLeod, it was neat to work for a woman, um, had such a vision for the Virginia wine industry and started working with a grape called Norton, which is indigenous to Virginia. And she really has become like the advocate for um, this particular varietal on the East Coast. And, and actually there's a book about her and her role in, in making this varietal a little bit more known and celebrated. And so, you know, Virginia and East Coast wine industry is very different than the West Coast wine industry. Sometimes reasons are justified. Sometimes it's sort of like, you know, well, the tradition on the West Coast is that it is world class. And, um, and I think there are some emerging um, locations on the East Coast that, that can certainly be world class. Um, and I think Jenny is one of those people who's trying to push for that. So I, it was a neat experience to work for her at a time when um, the Virginia wine industry was really starting to not just be a fanciful, fun, weekend, picnic kind of thing, but there's, there are serious 
winemakers and winery owners who are trying to set something, establish something that, that is considered world class. Sure, yeah. sure. And so then you're, so you kind of got your education there. What were you doing at that winery? So while I was at Chrysalis, I was the hospitality director. So I was involved with um, I, managing the, the tasting room. I didn't manage the tasting room, but I hired the manager and, and I kind of oversaw the, the tasting room. And then I worked a little bit with the, the fellow who was doing sales, direct sales outside of the winery. Um, and and then just did marketing and, and events and that kind of thing. And so it was a nice introduction to what it's like to be at a winery, both from the facility standpoint of running a running a, a winery as a location, as a destination, but then also seeing firsthand um, what happens at harvest when grapes are getting picked, what happens in the winery. Mm -hmm. And they were really generous that, you know, we could help out on the bottling line. We could go and, and check out things that were going on. And it piqued my interest. And the fellow who was the winemaker at the time, his name was Karem, um, he was just a, this smart, wonderful person. He went through the Virginia Tech winemaking program and Virginia Tech and Cornell are the two large um, wine, you wouldn't think Virginia, but Virginia Tech has a great winemaking program. In fact, Bruce Socklin, who oversees that program, is considered one of the most published hmm. researchers on American viticulture and does a lot of research in conjunction with UC Davis. So he's, he's kind of a heavy hitter right there in Virginia. And um, so I learned a lot through Karem and, um, and that really piqued my interest in, into eventually getting into winemaking. I knew the time wasn't right just then, but it was the wheels were turning for me at that point. So how did you get to Oregon from this point? So I left Chrysalis and I worked for a distributor in Washington DC and while I was at this distributor um, the focus was mostly well the, the fellow who I worked for my sales manager was from the Loire Valley so right away I was falling in love with wines from the Loire Valley and in particular working with um, an importer Louis Dresner and Joe Dresner at the time was in New York and would come down to the DC market and I worked with him many times he has since passed away but that was a pivotal moment for me in my career um, working with Joe and learning about all these amazing wines from the Loire Valley. And of course, he had other wines in his book too, but those were the ones that I tended to focus in on. But I had a lot of um, high-end restaurant accounts in Washington, D.C. I had about 80 restaurant accounts, the top restaurants in the city, um, a, a few bread and butter retail accounts, um, a few embassies, which was very cool. And when uh, one day I got um, addressed, I got... Um, there was a, a, apparently this contest going on with one of our uh, suppliers, and it was for Domaine Druin here in Oregon. And when we sold the Joseph Druin wines out of Burgundy, but then, of course, the Oregon book. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that there was a contest going on, but um, my coworker and I, we were invited as what's called a silver bullet to attend the Oregon Pinot Camp. <laughs> uh, and we were guests of Domaine Druin, so we got to stay at the Petite Maison, which is the little home that Veronique and her family, where they stay when they come to Oregon. And it was, it was just a once in a lifetime. So my coworker, Lucien, and I flew out and got a rental car. And the moment I landed in Oregon, I just felt like this was where I was supposed to be. Um, my father was actually raised in Eugene, Oregon, <laughs> so I have a ton of family in Eugene and up in Seattle as well, in the Seattle area. So it felt like coming home in many ways. What were your initial impressions of the Oregon wine industry? I was blown away by the collaboration, and this is very important, and I want to reiterate collaboration in the respect of how an industry not only sees itself, but wants to be seen. And so I've worked with and sold many wines from all over the world. I studied um, and got the certificate through the Wine and Spirit Education Trust and, and the advanced diploma. And I felt like I knew a lot about the wine industry at that point. I and mean, when you're, you're still new, you get so excited. So there's certain things that you get, you know, you want to focus on. Like I, I, when I see a lot of people who are new in the industry now, they're super excited about like natural wine or whatever it is, that it's, it's that thing that gives them that hook. Um, and so at the time when I, when I was looking sort of, especially at Pinot Camp, at what the Oregon wine industry was about, to me that hook was about that collaboration and that you had Adelsheim, Erath, Penner Ash, 
um, and then newer wineries that were up and emerging, all selling together, all going out in the market, um, promoting not only their own wines, but each other's wines, building categories in wine shops, building categories on wine lists. It's essential. And it's still to this day, you know, when I go back home on the East Coast, there's still a lot of restaurants that don't have Oregon wine on their list. So that impulse to create brand Oregon and to be collaborative, it was essential to this industry. And it speaks volumes about what we're doing here and why it's a special place. Um, and so I, I think it's very important as new people come in who don't have that background and just want to focus on themselves and their, their grapes and their mission, they have to learn about what our pioneers set for this industry and why. Because if they start to be competitive and sort of not embrace that, that collaboration, I think it's going to have a, a negative effect in the long term. So I think it's really important and vital for people who've been part of that early story to make sure that the, the new faces of the Oregon wine industry understand the spirit of the Oregon wine industry so that they can be part of it and not try to set themselves apart in a way that could be potentially, you know, um, that could potentially take away from, I think, the work that mm -hmm. still needs to be done. It's still, that continuation still needs to be done. Sure. If that makes sense. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So after Pinot Camp, mm -hmm. you, how long till you actually got back out here full time? Or how long did I you did, I was, so I was, it was the last day at Pinot Camp and I met Steve Volstek. Um, Steve Volstek's family, you probably have them uh, in the archives here, but um, he was the, um, not the CEO, but he was like the, the general manager at Eroth Vineyards. And I met Steve and one thing led to another. I was like, you know, I really would love to move out here and, and work for a winery. This is, I just feel like I need to be here. So we'd been, in, we'd been emailing and um, they had a position open up. And so we had a phone interview and then he was like, why don't you come out and um, spend some time with Dick and check out, you know, the bite of Oregon's going on at the time, and let's just let's have you come out and just you know see what you think. Mm -hmm. So he flew me out for the interview. Had a great weekend. Um, I loved spending time with Dick. It, he just is such a light to me. He's like to me the teddy bear of all the <laughs> of all the pioneers. Um, and I just have a, a soft spot in my heart for him because he's just has very sweet mannerism and was so interested in hearing where are you from, what's your story, why wine, what was that wine? The, the wine, La Nuit Magique, which I don't know if they talked about um, from Erath or Dick or any of anyone involved, but when he created that wine, La Nuit Magique, which is arguably his most, um, I don't know if I would say it's, it's the best wine, but, but it's the most focused wine that they would make with, with a lot of love and intention behind it. Um, came from a night when he, and I'm hope, I don't know if I'm perfectly retelling this story, but when he and some of his friends were sitting around um, drinking wine and saying, what was that aha moment for you? That, that glass of wine that was like, yes. And from that, they, you know, they called it like the La Nuit Magique, that, that night of magic for you. And they all had their different stories about what, what wine that was. And so they made a wine in honor of that, that spirit of like, this was the wine that changed my life. So, you know, he would ask me questions like that. And, and then he found out I had an Italian heritage. And one day when I was working at Erath, he left a volume of um, all the Italian varietals on my desk. And he's like, some light reading for you. <laughs> Great, and I just, I just really, I just really adored him. He, he's a, he's a special person in this industry. Even though he's kind of removed now, it seems like. I mean, he still has his property. And he still is around. Um, he's very, he's just very humble. I don't know. It was really cool to work there. So yeah, they moved. They, I met with them. I went back home, and two weeks later, they took care of having a moving truck come and move me out to Oregon. So I flew out with my two cats and <laughs> and I found a cute little cottage in Dundee on Warden Hill about a half a mile from the winery and it changed my life. So what were you doing while you were at ERAT? What was your job? I was a, a sales and marketing specialist. So I did national sales and marketing. Um, and so I did mostly the East Coast. That was my what I covered from Boston. Um, really I, would, I worked with Boston, New York, 
um, DC area. You know, now I'm like I'm forgetting. <laughs> this was a while ago, but but I would do sales trips and um, help plan our national sales meeting at the winery and. Every now and again, go hit golf balls over at Dick's house on Prince Hill Vineyard, which is fun. Um, it, was, it was really cool. Yeah. I'm curious, when you first went out, you've been hired, you're heading to the East Coast to sell mm -hmm. Oregon wine. Yes. What was, the, what was the response from people you were selling to? Sure. I mean, it, it's, again, it goes back to that whole collaboration. When any time I would travel, whenever I would travel, we would travel in pods. Like, it would be Shirley Brooks from Oak Cove. It would be, at the time, um, Kurt... Um, this fellow Kurt who was working at, um, oh my gosh, you know, I'm blanking, of course, um, at, um, my goodness, I'm blanking. That's okay. Anyways, there were a group of us that would, like, pod. It would be Pat Dudley from Bethel Heights, and, um, yeah, and we would all go to these different markets and sell. M many of us were in the same distrib distribution channel, so we'd go do these tastings, and, We'd all be going out to dinner together, do dinners together. And so we would literally, it was almost like doing an Oregon blitz, not just a winery blitz, where we're all out in the market around the same time selling brand Oregon. And so it was really cool to be part of that part of um, Oregon wine history. And you know, this is like the early 2000s, but it was special because Oregon wine was still not on lists. And you know, you'd think, oh, Oregon Pinot Noir, that should be everywhere. We were still building that that um, profile for different wine shops and wineries. So it was really cool to be um, going out in markets. The wines were always well received. It, and, and selling on the East Coast was so easy. You'd go into, um, you know, 11 Madison in New York City, six cases of this, six cases of that, and you're like, wow, okay. You know, like that was, you know, it made it, it kind of fooled me a little bit to think like, ooh, especially now when I sell my own wine, like I'm gonna go there and then drop six cases of my <laughs> wine. <laughs> so it was it was exciting to go into those markets as as part of a collaborative um, front, if you will. So we all we talk a lot about it's interesting you bring that up. We talk a lot about we hear a lot that selling wine is the hardest part. Like mm -hmm. that people love making wine, people love growing grapes, they love doing all that, but selling is the hardest part. So why is that? And and why and for you starting out, yeah. how long did it take you to figure that out? It, you know, I think sales I think the mistake people make when they try to sell wine is they try to be salesy, you know, and the and I think and what I mean by salesy, like they have an idea of what you need to do or how you need to be in order to sell wine. And I think the people who do well at selling their own wine recognize that it's all about relationships. I have a wine sales background, so I know how to, I, I worked every component of the wine industry except for being a vineyard manager before I took on my own brand. I think if someone is going to do this because it's the craziest thing and I struggle with it and it's hard, but um, for me, it's the financial part that, you know, juggling the financial part is the hardest part. Um, sales to me is the easiest part, honestly, because it's the most authentic. You go out there and you actually get to sit down and, but it's also easy for me because I knew before starting a brand that if I'm gonna do a business, it's like I had to create my own MBA and that's working every facet. I wasn't interested in just making my own wine. It wasn't about me and it wasn't about, look what I did, like I made this Cab Franc. It was, if I'm gonna do a business, then I need to understand my industry. I need to study up on it. I need to know how to do this so that I'm successful. And I think that's a responsible approach. Um, so I tried to work every facet. And in doing that, I had relationships already established for sales. Um, and even though I'm not necessarily selling directly to the people I worked with when I was, say, at working for Erath or Adelsheim, um, or even when I was at St. Michelle, I, I have enough of a know-how to go in, find the right distri distributor, I know exactly what I need to do to set that up, and I've been very, I mean, it, a lot of it's luck too, but, but beyond the luck, it's, I'm not making a wine that's competitive with other wines right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm the only person in Oregon who's focused on Cap Franc, 100%. That is my program. I have a couple little things on the side, but seven of the nine wines I make have Cap Franc in them, or are strictly Cap Franc. So, so similar to how the, when the pioneers came in, they're like, it's Pinot, and they have like five single vineyards, and then maybe they do a white Pinot Noir, a rosé of Pinot Noir, right? And then Pinot Gris, and maybe a Gamay. It's kind of the same thing. I'm still, they're still Pinot producers. They have just a couple little things they do on the side. That's, for me, it's all about Cap Franc. 
So I don't really have anyone, there's no one else in the industry who's doing that. So it's very easy for me to go into a market where there's space for me on the shelf. <laughs> sure. You know? sure. My my real competitors are Loire Valley, you know, other places mm -hmm. that are like strictly Cab Franc focused. Sure. So we'll come back to your label in just a second, but I'm curious before we get to that, you talked about kind of how you went about preparing for your label. Mm -hmm. So after Erath, so you got to Erath right before he sold. So take yes. us through kind of the sale and then what happened next. Yes, so when it was announced that, that Dick was selling the winery, um, it, it was just a very, it just kind of, I, you know, and it happened so, it seemed to happen so fast, like to when we found out, then to when it was announced. Um, and then, of course, everyone's wondering, what is that going to mean for my job? And right away, um, the director of communications at St. Michelle Wine Estates contacted me, and they said, we want to make sure you're on board. At the time, I was one of the found founding board members for the Dundee Hills Wine Growers Association, so I was very involved with the Dundee Hills Wine Growers Association, and they saw value in that and didn't want uh, ERATH to lose that, um, that position. And so they kind of interviewed me to get a better understanding of what my job was, what I did, and then how they can utilize me to help transition the winery. So even though I went up, they separate at St. Michelle the communications department from the marketing department. So even though I wasn't going into their marketing department, they were creating a position for me in communication. Um, I still worked very closely with all facets of marketing, everything from the branding, everything from um, labels and maintaining the integrity of the website and all the different things they wanted to do to make sure it was just a seamless transition. I was up in, in the headquarters at St. Michelle helping out with that, just being a just being a resource and then um, working on the communication side. And then I had other wineries that I also got to work with, including the Colsolari project mm -hmm. in Red Mountain with the Antonori family, which was really exciting. Um, and then the Walla Walla properties, including Spring Valley Vineyard, which was just a joy for me to work with the Corkum family, and then Serge, the winemaker, and then also North Star Winery. Um, so I got to learn a totally different side of the industry. St. Michelle Wine Estates is a brilliant company that, and, and it was, I was very lucky to work there because I learned such a big picture piece of the industry. And there's still, for a corporate, um, wine group, they're still small compared to a lot of other competitors that are like enormous, like all over the world, mm -hmm. you know, brands from e almost every region. They are a little bit more focused and they are still very much um, sort of a, 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 a light for the Northwest. Um, of course, their focus being mostly in Washington, but now being having Erath in Oregon and, and also the properties in California, but they really do, um, they really have historically as a pioneering winery um, made so many things happen in the Washington wine industry. So I felt like I, I was lucky to work with a company that, that had every intention to continue to uplift the quality and the presence mm -hmm. um, so that writers knew about the Pacific Northwest as a, as a category. So it was a really great place for me to work. Um, but alas, I wanted to be in Oregon. I'm an Oregon girl, you know, my dad's from Oregon. Um, so I had an opportunity to come back to Oregon, work with another pioneer, David Adelsheim, and I said, absolutely. <laughs> so um, I came back and took over the market and communication helm. But the interesting thing is when I came, the, the timing was funny because I was already starting to get a little burned out from marketing. Um, I was really wanting to get into production and I just didn't know how, I didn't know how to make that transition. And, um, you know, I really tried to, to maintain a, a, um, everything that they needed at Adelsheim for the brand, for the branding and the communication. But in the back of my head, I was just like, I was so ready to like be in this next phase. And, you know, it was a, it was a hard talk, but I had to talk with David. And, um, and when it was time for me to part, it was actually very encouraging, and um, I don't know if I would have had the guts to leave a full-time, well-paid job and jump into hourly, <laughs> seasonal, not sure if you're gonna work kind of scenario had he not given me sort of a, a good, like, you know, you're, you're not, this isn't what you wanna do. <laughs> and I was like, you're right. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good, it was a good push, I needed it. Um, 
So from there, I enrolled in the Chemeketa um, Northwest Viticulture Center to do the two-year program in enology um, while Barney was at the helm. Mm -hmm. Barney Watson, mm -hmm. wow, how cool <laughs> was that? He's amazing. And while I was there, uh, I took on my first harvest job at Anime Vineyards, working with Thomas Hausman. So that's how we transitioned from, you know, inside. It's almost like front of the house, back of the house, you know, in, in a restaurant. But how I, <laughs> I moved from the front of the house of the wine to the back of the house. And so all along at this point, you now now you're 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 in. You want to create your own label. Yes. So you go through production a couple more years. You're working at a couple other places. I still needed to learn. So I was in school. I had already a, a, a pretty good chemistry background. Um, I, I. Um, and then I took some microbiology, went through the program, and um, wanted to really get a strong understanding of the science of winemaking because it's critical. It's critical to understand what's happening with the science of your wine. <laughs> That's critical. And, um, and so that was really important to me. So I, I really wanted to focus on school. And um, while I was working at Anime, just sort of, I was a sponge. I just wanted to like watch process, watch how um, Thomas and his crew, how they and his assist, he had two assistants, how they came about making decisions. Um, I just wanted to kind of observe and absorb, and they were really great. They they didn't. It wasn't just someone coming in a physical body of someone who wanted to work a harvest and then go. Like they understood that. No, I I want to like absorb everything, and and they're they're great with all of their interns. I mean, they they bring in some amazing people. Um, so it was cool to be part of that crew. But I felt like um, you know I got to spend some time with with. Tammy, one of the assistants in the lab, and ask questions, and because I was in school at the same time, so I, I was learning what questions to ask. You know, <laughs> sure. otherwise, had I just gone in during harvest and not been in school, I wouldn't have known the questions to ask. Um, so it was very important that I had that happening at the same time. Um, and then after working at NME, you know, I was like, okay, so now I'm out of work. What do I do? And I just started consulting. So I had it started, I, that's where my business actually started. So I got my LLC, mm. LJC Wine Co. And I did consulting first because I had that marketing background. So I worked with other wineries to help them with their marketing and just sort of give them tools. And at the time, QR codes were just coming out. So we would, I worked with a couple wineries where we did some technology with QR codes. And it was a great way to get some income while I was still in school. I, I had a six month contract at Willa Kenzie where I did some marketing with them. Um, that was really great. And uh, it gave me some steady income and I could learn and try to be helpful there. And, um, but when that six months came up, um, you know, I was ready for another intern position. And so I went to work at Shea Wine Cellars to work for Drew Voigt because the guy's the smartest one, guy in the wine industry. He truly is one of the smartest people in the wine industry, but certainly in Oregon. Um, I had just mad respect for him and wanted to learn from him. And so um, he invited me to come in, not just to work the couple months of harvest, but I started in early June and he helped, I basically got to assist him while he did all the blending and bottling. So for the, for the previous vintage before going into harvest. So right away, while I was still in school, now again, it's not, you can't learn how to make wine just by working harvests. It's, it's not possible. I mean, it is, but it's, you're, I don't, to me, it's not possible. Because you're only getting a small segment of the winemaking process, um, and you're not part of any of the decision makings. You're literally cleaning up stuff and doing you know, tasks. So for me to be able to have his attention from this time of when he's blending and sit down and watch him do blending trials and then you know he would have me clean barrels and I was learning all the, the process of what was happening when he was racking and going you know I, I got to see it participate ask the questions again it's always about asking the questions um, and then as soon as we bottled and it was great I mean I was loading the truck I was like with the forklift like at this point like I was becoming a cellar worker and um, and then when harvest came and the other two interns, he always had three interns, it was typically two women and a male. So it'd be like two women, two men working as a team, which was very cool. He didn't set out to do that, but it kind of always just worked out that way. And I thought that was really interesting. He was very yin and yang with that, a lot of balance. But the other two people came on board and right away we started prepping the winery for harvest and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. and. He had us in the vineyards doing sampling, and you know, Shea, Shea Vineyard is an iconic vineyard. It is 
worthy of a Grand Cru status. So to be able to spend time with one of the smartest men in the wine industry, smartest people in the wine industry, um, in an iconic vineyard, I mean, I, it doesn't get better than that. I felt like that was privilege for my, for me to be at this, in this spot on this journey. It, I couldn't have picked, I couldn't have been luckier. Um, so after harvest, um, back to consulting again, finishing up school, and then I just decided I wanted to see a second vintage at the same place. So she was like, come on back. So I came back and helped again with from trials of blending to when we're getting ready for bottling. And so I, you know, I'm seeing almost the full cycle of winemaking, not quite, but almost. Um, and even though he couldn't hire a, a full-time assistant, I felt like I was given an opportunity to, again, work with this great vineyard, great winemaker for longer than what is usually available. And so that was great. And then from there, after working with Drew, and he had started his own label at that time, that was 2011, that second vintage with him. I, that's when I decided I wanted to make my own wine and I started with a barrel. I literally got 750 pounds of Cab Franc grapes from Chris Berg at Roots Wine Company. <laughs> he was getting some fruit up in Walla Walla and I called Chris, I'm like, I need some Cab Franc. I know you're getting some, can you sell me 750 pounds or whatever? He said, absolutely. So that was a fun, that in itself was a fun ride, like going up to Walla Walla with Chris Berg. I mean, I never laughed so much in my life. That guy's so funny. Um, I'm not gonna tell, there's some stories, you know, like I don't wanna, I don't wanna like get him in trouble. <laughs> Police officer, speeding ticket, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, I'm kidding, but, um, and so that was it. That was I knew right away I wanted to make a white cap franc. Um, it wasn't an arbitrary. Let's make a red wine from white grapes. I knew that um, with at work, working in particular at Anami Vineyards with um, his Prisme, which is the white Pinot Noir there. Uh, I was just very. I was in awe of how he was making a white wine from red grapes and. There's no, I, I didn't learn the formula per se. I, the only thing I had to do with it at the time was just they were in punchins, these larger barrels, and I would just check bricks and temps every day. And I was like, how is this turning from salmon pink to like white? It blew my mind, you know? And so that kind of piqued the curiosity of two years later when I decided to make my wine. Um, I knew I wanted to make a white cab franc because just like in Champagne where they have Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier for sparkling wine, the Blanc de Noir, in the Loire Valley, they often use Cabernet Franc as a base wine for both um, uh, regular bubbles or the or the rosé. And so, if they make a base wine with no skin, no color, it's often blended um, with Chenin Blanc Chardonnay, or sometimes on its own, but more more often than not, it's blended. So it's been done, just not for still wine. And so I was like, if they're making white Pinot Noir, I'm going to make a white Cab Franc. So it was something that it's been done just for sparkling and not still. <laughs> So. And you were, and even at this point, you were already you had determined to do Cab Franc. Yes. So why why exactly that grape? Well, like I said, when I was in Washington D.C. working for the distributor, my boss was from the Loire Valley, and I just cut my teeth on those Loire wines. They're just bright, beautiful Cab Francs that, you know, when I would go to a dinner party, there are typically two wines that I would bring, always, because I knew they would always go with food and they'd be crowd pleasers. The first, I'd grab a bottle of Morgon, so a Cru Beaujolais. Um, and Gamay is just great, goes with everything, and it's a crowd pleaser. The other wine I would typically bring to a dinner, again, this is before I moved out here, but these were my go-to wines, um, was a blend from the Loire Valley, and it's Clos Roche Blanche, and it's a 40% Gamay, 60% Cab Franc. They call it Cuvée Pif, P-I-F. And um, that wine, I mean, I bring that to a dinner party and it's just it's amazing. It just goes with everything and it's a crowd pleaser. People who like big, bold red wines and people who like light, almost nothing to white wines, everyone would love those two wines. So um, coming here, I knew that I wanted to make something like that. So the very first red wine I actually made, the first wine I made was a white Cab Franc. I knew it was always gonna be Cab Franc. I knew it was always gonna be about Cab Franc. My second vintage, so the first vintage I only made one wine, a white wine, one barrel, like 23 cases, <laughs> silly. But that's what I did to get started. Um, 
And then the second vintage I was gonna, I made uh, my first red wine, and that was 40% Gamay, 60% Cab Franc, and I called it Oregon Tour Rain, a little play on words since Tour Rain is the region in the Loire Valley that it was modeled after, if you will. So how did you go about choosing vineyards, and how did and how did you choose your location for your for your home base? So having been in the industry for a long time, and having just through years of doing events and um, networking and just knowing people, um, I had met Herb Quaddy. Um, I think I, and I I think the first time I actually really met Herb was I was writing, I'm also, I have a degree in writing and I was freelance writing quite a bit, but I was writing a story for the Oregon Wine Press on um, winemakers who work for wineries but then also make their own wine on the side. And so um, I was, I was, Herb was one of the winemakers at the time where he was at Troon but he was making his Quadi North on the side. And so we all collaborated and came together for this amazing photo shoot with Andrea Johnson at, um, we were somewhere in downtown McMinnville. It was a long table and we had food out and it was like eight different winemakers who were working for wineries, making wine on the side. And um, yeah, and so it was um, one of these things where we just started talking and I was curious about what he was doing. And so the first year I got my grapes from via Chris Berg mm -hmm. and a vineyard that he he was working with, but when I knew Cap Franc was it, I wanted it eventually to be all Oregon. Um, I knew to call Herb, and so he he and I then sat down and really came up with a plan for how we were going to knock out the best white Cap Franc possible. He and I sat down. It was like it was my project, it was my baby, but he definitely gave the um, gave it the the sort of life from the standpoint of the vineyard. Um, of really what we what we could what we could do to make this even better, and so yeah, it was really cool working with him. And then um, through Jim Berno at Willamette Valley, um, they were working with the Moore family, Michael Moore's family, um, Quail Run Vineyards, and you know I had the Griffin Creek wines, and I knew that I, I learned about Michael and. Um, so I called up Michael and I explained what I was doing and that between Michael and Herb, I mean really they've been, it's been a dream and especially working with Michael, it's so different because I get most of my fruit now from Michael and I just adore him, I adore, I mean I adore both of them, truly I'm lucky to work with both of them, but he, he has this sort of like um, vision and he right away was like, you're part of this vision. Like, you're doing something that no one else is doing. I have lots of people who I work with and they're amazing customers. He's like, but you're kind of a, a special niche. Like, we're really proud of what you're doing. Um, he's just super supportive. And so, and both of them are really, it's amazing. And now, because of Herb, I have a new grower relationship established with the Buxton Vineyard. Um, and so, He's facilitated that, and that's where I'm getting the cap front for my rosé, and now I'm getting a little bit more for the red blend as well. So it's like you just sort of have these people who are already lined up down there. They're leading the way, and they're um, just very available, and, and they like both of them know what my program is, they know what I'm trying to do, and they know where to find the right grapes for my program. It's really cool. So yeah, that's kind of how I got into Southern Oregon and how I, I cultivated those relationships. And meantime, while that was happening, Jim Berno, my first, it was my second vintage, um, I met, he said, come into the office, I mean, you know, let's chat. And he's like, I want to hear about what you're doing. And he mentored me for the first part of getting this business going. I, again, it's just being very lucky. We, it's once in a lifetime when you get to have these connections with people here who are the, the, really the foundation of our industry and I don't know I just feel very lucky that he gave me five minutes you know let alone five minutes it was like an hour you know so it was really I'm very lucky that these different people have stepped up and noticed what I was doing and, and wanted in some way to to guide me or help me so the, so the reaction of the industry was certainly very positive I'm curious what the reaction from consumers as you're trying to sell this kind of unusual product 
Yeah, I think um, Cap Franc has been out there, and it's certainly one of the most largely planted varietals in the world. But you don't see a lot of standalone Cap Franc in America because a lot, especially in Washington and Oregon, there's a love affair with the blends, like the Bordeaux blends, the Meritage blends. And blends are amazing. And Cab Franc has its place in those blends for a very, very specific reason. Cab Franc brings ageability to those wines. And why? Because it has incredible acidity and amazing tannin structure. So those two components um, lift and elevate those wines to go years, 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 years of aging. And some of the best Bordeaux's, um, you know, that are 50, 60, 70, however many years old, are um, predominantly Cab Franc based. Yeah. So, uh, how, so I, I try to, are you selling mostly in Oregon and how are Oregon consumers reacting to I it? I started off initially uh, in Oregon and my first vintage it was really like Savannah Ray when she was at Wildwood. She was one of the first people to like this wine, yes, my white Cab Franc. She and then Larry at Elephants. Like there were a handful of people who were just like yes and like made it happen for me. And then little by little, um, yeah, I grew um, a mailing list and then got a wine club started. My wine club's small, but um, it's very kind of focused. And then, um, and then little by little, using my background in sales and, and national sales, finding the distributors um, and working with friends who made recommendations like, hey, you should check out this distributor. They're gonna love your wine. Um, so it's kind of, it was multifaceted in how I got outside of Oregon. But really I started off self-distributing initially and then I realized like I'm one woman doing everything. <laughs> it's exhausting. Um, and so I finally brought on a, a local distributor here first. Um, and then I had a contact in California who I worked with for years for these other wineries who was amazing. And I contacted him he said, send me the samples. And right away he got on board and because of that, his participation and his influence and his circle of people and, um, and his support of the brand, he's the one who helped bring my wine to the San Francisco Chronicle and, and thus uh, I was very lucky in 2015 to be one of their winemakers to watch. Um, so that wouldn't have been possible if not for Northwest Wines Limited in California, they're great. And then um, Washington, I had been in touch with a fellow at American Northwest, and then a friend of mine kind of went in and sealed the deal because he was selling some wine. Um, so they've actually been my number one distributor. Seattle's killing it for me. I don't know, they're, they're great, great people, and they love the wine, and they're behind it, and they get it, and they see where it should be. And it takes all, away all of the work I have to do. It's amazing. And then Minnesota was, seemed like a random place to go next but this market is the in St. Paul and Minneapolis is absolutely incredible um, very savvy wine beautiful restaurants it, it, again a place that makes sense for my wines and my last name's Jorgensen so like you know it makes sense being in Minnesota <laughs> um, and then from there we opened up New York DC uh, well, New York and, and New Jersey, Pennsylvania is a cluster, and then Virginia and D.C., my hometown. So, um, you know, just steadily, slowly growing. I don't, I'm not interested in jumping volume fast because um, every business advisor I talked to said just do it incrementally, incrementally, incrementally. So that's what I've been doing and slowly opening up markets. So I'm curious what, and this can go back all the way back to when you're sort of learning the seller to, to now, what have the been, what's been the biggest surprise to you uh, through your kind of journey through the industry? The biggest surprise, how much money it costs to do this. It's crazy, <laughs> it's stupid, I mean, it's so expensive. I mean, in some ways I would advise people, you know, gosh, it, it, the financial burden of doing this, I'm being just honest, is so, it's so paralyzing at times because I don't have a trust fund. You know, I don't have um, parents who are like, "Here, Leah, here's two hundred thousand dollars. Make your dreams come true." <laughs> no, that's not at all what happened. I, I took out, I cleared out my savings account, and now I have no savings, and it's scary. And <laughs> like, you know, you make these decisions on a leap of faith, and um, you know, I have uh, through a friend, a uh, former employer, actually the woman who founded this wine bar. She introduced me to a couple who was very interested in what I was doing. They, um, the wife, it's a husband and wife, the wife, um, she 
had spent a lot of time in France and, and was sort of a Francophile and loved the Loire Valley and just was delighted by what I was doing that was different. And he's um, just this sort of brilliant, creative um, fellow who has this really interesting side. He has this interesting business that is unlike anything I'd ever seen. Um, it's, it's Staver Locomotive in Northwest Industrial, and he built this incredible indoor-outdoor steam engine train track so that people who have collectible trains have a place to run their trains. <laughs> it's amazing. They're just the most creative, loving people, and so I'm very lucky that they wanted to come on board and, and help me out. So they've been instrumental in, in helping me move forward, but I tell you what, if they didn't come into the picture, there's no way. I don't know how people continue unless they have investors, 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 or a trust fund. It's impossible. It's impossible. Like, I thought you could just start it small and grow it. You can't. You will run out of money, and then people will not sell you grapes, and will not sell you tanks, and will not sell you barrels. So it's that part, learning as I go, you know, it's one thing if you're working for a winery and you're managing six, you know, when I was at St. Michelle, I was managing five, six budgets. Easy. Doing this, like, there's no how-to book on how to be a successful business. Because even though there are people who are like, I'm an artist, I'm making wine, it's so romantic, it's great. You still have a business, and if you're not running that business, you're not gonna be able to do the artsy fun part of making wine, and that's, that's kind of a harsh reality check, you know? So I don't know. I, I talked to um, Harry Peterson Nedry and Bill Sweat. Um, we had a little group that goes to uh, the Portland Opera and we're all opera enthusiasts, and we had dinner one night before an opera, and, and we'd been talking about um, how the Oregon wine industry really needs to sustain itself if we want to continue to be Oregon families, Oregon spirit, Oregon identity, um, and a lot of that is the financial side, like having the banks here really supporting this industry, because if you go to California, they have banks set up just to support the California wine industry, and that doesn't really exist here, so it's really challenging, I think, even for families with means to continue on, and um, even when you're thinking about succession, can you continue the business here, can it be supported, or do you have to sell? And so it's a very hot topic right now for a lot of families who are looking at succession. Um, and bigger than that, for the, some of these families, like Harry, are looking at the, the new brands coming in. How, how do we make sure that they can continue this legacy? So it's, it's an interesting time, and I think it comes down to the financials. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, um, one of the questions I, was kind of, I kind of skipped over earlier because you were going through your journey, but I'm curious about um, challenges of doing marketing and communication in the wine industry. What is unique about the wine industry that makes it more challenging, right. and has that changed in the years you've been working with it? Well, it's you don't sell wine the way you sell green tea, kombucha, an automobile. It's a, it's its own network, and it goes back to really even prohibition, to be honest. So these are some of the laws and some of the traditions are antiquated, but we still have to operate and work in within those parameters. So depending, and it's state by state too. So we have like, sorry about the train or the, the bus. Um, we have on one hand this, this um, you know, the, I got sidetracked by the bus. We were talking. That's good. Okay. Um, selling wine state by state and the kind of right. the, the kind of the antiquated system. Right. So you have a, f a federal mandate of how we're allowed to sell wine, and then every state's different, and then there's compliance, and it's really it can be that alone compliance and selling wine to different markets can be for some people that kiss of death of you know what I don't want to do this. That is so much extra work that is so unnecessary. <laughs> All I want to do is make wine and sell it to people. This is a this is a problem. So I think it can be very challenging when you are earnestly trying to put a product out in the world and you're not gonna have the same issues if you're making kombucha or if you're making green tea in a can, you know what I mean? But when you're making wine, all of a sudden, you know, you have to go through all these crazy hoops. And it's, some people, it's, it's, almost, it's enough that they're not gonna wanna continue doing the business. It just, it's, it can be, it can be limiting. Um, so there's that, and that's a big part of why when we were talking about sales, I mean, it, it's a challenge to, to just sell your wine sometimes, and then of course it's alcohol, so you know, you have to, you have compliance, you have, um, you know, you have to make sure you're 
doing everything under what's federally or state by state mandated for selling alcohol. And it's, it's a lot. I get it and I get why, but it's a lot. And so, especially if you're doing everything by yourself or you're just two people, like a husband and a wife, you know, or two friends starting a business or partners or whatever, it, it can be really, really difficult to sort of divide and conquer and deal with when sometimes the sales part seems like it's even more than the winemaking. So, yeah, I think um, being able to build your retail, let's face it, you get most bang for your buck by selling your own wine, but it, that too can be a challenge. It's a, it's a saturated market. There's people who know already in their head when they're going to go into an event, like, I, this is how much money I'm going to spend on a bottle. And they usually don't, they don't usually deviate far from that. They, if it's I'm going to spend 20 bucks on a bottle of wine. They're rarely going to go much further than 20 bucks. And so you have to figure out pricing, like how you're going to be able to reach um, reach people who are going to be willing to spend what, what you're asking for. Um, at the on the flip side of that, most people who are selling wine, it's not it's not this arbitrary number of like I just want to make a lot of money. It's like no, I just want to be able to pay my barrels. Like it's so expensive when you're a small producer. It's more expensive in some ways that you just want to be able to cover your costs. Um, so that's why a lot of of bottles are priced the way they are. Um, so it's really just understanding your target market and who's buying the wine, who's interested in your category, and then. Um, those distribution channels of who's going to be same thing, who's going to be interested in your category, who's going to be able to like go gangbusters with your wine and sell it. Sure. So I don't know if that mm -hmm. specifically answered your question, Definitely. but it's, yeah. it's, it's something you have to be aware of, of of those channels. And when you were saying like how is it different selling wine than anything else, it is a three tier system. So there are other industries where yes, it's a three tier system, but it's very special in its three tier system. So you have the supplier. Then you have the distributor, and then you have the on and off-premise customer. And that's just one chain. That's not direct, obviously. Um, so you have to have a great relationship with your distributor. You know, you, everyone wants to get paid and paid on time. <laughs> and then you have to have a great relationship with those customers, too, so that they continue to love your wine and, and be advocates and, you know, go out and, and speak the gospel of what you're doing. Sure, sure. Yeah. So what's your winemaking philosophy? Uh, I, you know, I feel like I follow what a lot of the pioneers and the early folks who started this industry is that a minim I take a minimalist approach. And basically, what does that mean? I also have a nutrition degree, so I have a holistic nutrition background, and um, I know a lot about chemi I know enough about chemistry, biochemistry, microbiology to understand that this is a very complex thing that we're doing. A fermentation is a very complex thing. Um, so for me. Taking a minimalist approach means, more importantly, I'm paying attention to what the vintage and the site give me, because those variables always change. For me to have one stuck philosophy, when those variables I know are going to change each year that I'm making wine, I'm going to set myself up for something potentially disastrous. So you have to be open and flexible to what's happening. If I were to be, for example, a natural winemaker and say, I'm not adding anything to my wine, and then I, in Southern Oregon, we have this happen and we have that happen, and then um, the site we are seeing this happening, and I, in global warming, perfect example. We know global warming's happening, it's a real thing. Um, Scientists in Germany are doing extensive research on the microbes that are now coming into the winery as a result of global warming. It's a real thing. It's a real problem. It's already happening here. If you say pediococcus to a winemaker, I don't know how many winemakers here actually know what that is. I would assume at least those who definitely went to school know. Um, it's our job to know. Pediococcus is a spoilage microorganism, and what happens if pediococcus takes over an, a native ferment, it'll complete the ferment or get it close to it, but it's also going to impart other things that are not terroir. They're going to impart things that are going to be potentially harmful. So things like biogenic amines. Biogenic amines are byproducts of secondary fermentation, can be, or spoilage microorganisms. And when you have these compounds in your finished wine, 
it is more it can be more problematic than sulfur will ever be mm. sulfur is highly regulated we have OSHA coming in we can't even make it is so regulated if people are not following regulations that's on them but if you are a real winery you are following regulations and you are using parts per million if you can eat a pickle it, I guarantee you a pickle is almost three times what you're gonna get in a bottle of wine so for people to go on about sulfur in a bottle of wine they don't understand the chemistry they don't understand the addition and they don't understand the um, the solution and what's actually doing and then you have on the flip side wines that are neglected potentially or they just don't know about there's pediococcus in my wine what is that and then you have now biogenic amines which is being researched in the European community right now where they're going to potentially have to put allergen information because once you have biogenic amines in your wine it doesn't matter what um, uh, you know the, the volume of it being in the wine if it's just there um, it can cause problems for people who have autoimmune disease heart disease so I have celiac disease. If I drink an unfiltered wine that has a biogenic amine in it, within three minutes, I'm red, sneezing, completely congested, and I can't breathe. I almost have an asthmatic reaction. <laughs> so it's a real thing, um, and people don't talk about it. And so I talk about it, probably to the annoyance of some, but I think it's important. It's my job to talk about it when I know about it. So yes, when we talk about approach and philosophy, I minimalist, being clean, making sure your wine is pure and not um, it's not just what you put in, but what are you leaving in? I'm very aware. I do a lot of lab work. Um, obviously, I filter. So by doing um, cross flow filtration, which is an amazing process, um, you can taste, smell side by side before and after. I don't lose any flavor. I don't lose any um, aromatic. In fact, what happens is cross flow filtration takes collo colloidal material, these larger um, proteins and things that don't need to be in your wine, it removes them, so guess what happens? Your aromatics lift. It actually enhances aromatics and it enhances flavors. So when people ignorantly talk about cross flow, that it doesn't do that, <laughs> or that it actually does the opposite, they say it's gonna mask, you know, it's gonna take away, they don't understand the technology. So it's really important. There's a lot of voices of people talking about wine and they're put in a position of being an expert and they're putting wrong information out there so people don't understand what's in their wine and they don't understand the, the technology of why we're using these things. There's a reason why we're evolving. There was a great wine, I went to a wine dinner at an Italian restaurant uh, two weeks ago and um, the fellow was with the Santa Margarita wine group, so not just Santa Margarita but they have all these amazing off the beaten path Chiantis and Chianti Classicos and really high grade um, DOCG wines and he said um, you know that if we didn't use science in the wine we would not evolve we would not evolve we would be stuck making things that were not necessarily the best and so um, and I hate to use the word the best but they, but you you're not evolving just that I think that speaks volumes and, and evolving doesn't mean that we're trying to trick and become genetically modified or industrial that's not what technology is for technology is to make sure we're aware of things like global warming and how do we how do we take care of that how do we prevent spoilage so that's that's in a long-winded way that's how I that's how I approach wine is just being informed knowing what I'm doing, asking questions when I need to from people who are far smarter than I am, and, um, and being very aware, doing lab, constant lab work to see what's in my wine so I understand what I'm pre presenting to the public. But obviously trying to make something at the same time that's going to delight people and, and be as pure to the vineyard and the site as possible. And that's very easy to do when you're just, again, being open and flexible to what each site and what vintage you are, what, what those variables are from vintage to vintage. So what's it like being a woman in the wine industry? What's it like being a woman in the wine industry? It's so funny because, you know, it would be nice to say, it would be nice to say, I want to be um, in a time where I'll pour my, my wine and no one's thinking, did a man or a woman make this? Like, there, I, I understand why some people feel that way, but I actually kind of dig it and I love it when, when people recognize that a woman made this. Variety of reasons. First of all, I think men and women approach things differently, and I, you know, I don't want to. And I don't want to extrapolate on myths of gender. You know what I mean? Because some people are this way, some people are that way. I don't want to hold 
hold on to an idea that this is how women are and this is how men are. But in general, um, there are different approaches, m not because of our the biology, but just because of tradition and, and, and process and practice. Um, and so, and then part of that is women taste wine differently than men do. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of, there's a lot of, I think, there's a lot to be said for a woman who's tasting her wine and through the process from start to finish of what she's sensing based on you know this long genetic history of when we were far less sophisticated and male our male counterparts were out hunting and we were gathering we were tasting like crazy and that's why a lot of women are super tasters they were tasting not simply because they were looking to make good food, <laughs> what they were doing was they were tasting to assess that they weren't going to poison their young. And so there's this whole long line of why women, why women are very skilled at tasting. Um, anyway, so there's that, and I think that's kind of cool. But aside from that, um, you know, I feel like there are things in the winery that are sometimes limiting because they were addressed and built for men who are making wine. Example, I, my ratio from where my wrist to my, my arm socket, you know, like I sometimes can't reach things and it's, I, we laugh about it, but like um, some, of the, some of the equipment, it's not that I don't have the strength to do it, I'm a pretty strong person, but my hands might be too small to get around something. So I, I find little weird things like that that are not necessarily limitations, I just have to be creative about how I can make up for what is, if it was built differently, like it was like, then men and women could easily use this lever. I don't know, it's, little, <laughs> it's silly little things like that that I notice that are kind of inco inconsequential, but, but I do think about them. But otherwise, um, I think most, if not all of the men I've worked for have not treated me any different, if anything, maybe have been happy to have me on a team because I'm not gonna be not to say that women are less reckless, but I, my observation in the winery is that women go slower on the forklift.